Let us pray. O come, O come, Emmanuel, be with us here as we listen, as we wait, as we prepare for the good news of the coming Christ. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Today is the first Sunday of Advent which means exactly what it sounds like it means, that today is a beginning. It is the start of a new year for us Christians. The Christian calendar gives us a way to order our lives around significant occasions in Jesus' life, just like Jesus' life was ordered around significant religious festivals and holidays. So today is not... New Year's Day, but it is the day that we say Happy New Year to one another in the church. And at the start of this new year, we're going to consider what it means to be on the way to the manger. And each Sunday, we'll consider a different character who teaches us something of what it means to journey faithfully, because a life of faith, after all, is a life of being on the way. We make it to the manger at Christmas only to discover an invitation to a lifelong journey of faith. And we never fully arrive. There's always more ground to walk. And so not only will these characters teach us what it means to be on the way to the manger, but I hope they'll also teach us something about what it means to be on the way as people of faith long after Christmas has come and gone. And so today we're going to start with Zechariah. Now, Zechariah was married to Elizabeth, Mary's cousin, and sometimes they get a passing nod around this time of year, but if they do, it's usually Elizabeth who is the star of the show, and I wanted to preach Elizabeth, honestly. We share a name, and this year I feel a special attachment to her as I am also in the midst of expecting a child. But I decided that Zechariah has something really important to offer us, and so it has been fun to spend time with his story. But I also understand why they get forgotten. They don't seem too unique. They're just another old couple in the Bible who can't have children. That is hardly an original plot among biblical characters. And because Zechariah and Elizabeth always get paired with Mary and Joseph, they're always overshadowed. Mary's story is always going to get the limelight when she is in the picture with Elizabeth. And in fact, the story that we're going to read today was almost left out of the Gospels altogether. Elizabeth and Zechariah's story comes at the very beginning of Luke's Gospel, It's the first chapter, but most scholars will tell you that they think Luke's gospel was originally intended to start at chapter 3, and if you flip to chapter 3 later on, you'll see that it has a very stately opening. It sounds like the opening of the other gospels. It says, in the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, it sounds like the start of the other gospels. But for some reason, at some point in time, chapters 1 and 2 got tacked on in front of chapter 3. And so we have the gift of the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth and the birth of Jesus before hopping to chapter 3, which begins with Jesus wandering in the wilderness before being baptized by John and then starting his ministry. And so a logical question for us to ask as we read this scripture is, why? Why is this included if it's not part of Luke's original gospel? Why would someone write this story down and add it on for us? And so we're going to turn to the beginning of Luke's gospel, chapter 1, and I invite you to ask, why? As we hear this story, we'll start at verse 5. Listen now to what the Spirit is saying to her church this day. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah 
who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was descended from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Once, when Zechariah was serving as priest before God during his section's turn of duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord to offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to Zechariah an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, how can I know this will happen? For I am an old man, and my wife, well, she's getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he returned to his home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, this is what the Lord has done for me in this time. When he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace, I have endured among my people. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The question remains, why? Why was this story added? Why would this story be tacked on to the beginning of Luke's gospel? Well, there are lots of theories. Some say maybe Luke got curious about Jesus' birth and added it on. Some say that maybe there was someone else who'd heard these stories through the oral tradition and finally wrote them down. But I love the conclusion that one pastor came to, that it must have been Jesus' mom. Luke was writing several decades after Jesus' life, and Mary was probably 85 at the time. Can't you just imagine? Word got around with Luke's version of events, which didn't start until Jesus was about 30 years old. And can you just imagine Mary hearing Luke's version and sending out word that she needed to meet with that author? And so <laughs> she sits him down and says, young man, it's a valiant effort, but you've missed some things. This story begins long before Jesus' 30th birthday and long before you were ever on the scene. This story begins with some strange stuff that happened when I was only a teenager. Take a seat. Let me tell you what you've missed. First, my Aunt Elizabeth she and her husband, Zechariah, lived in the hill country. And both of them were from priestly families. Zechariah was a priest. They had no children of their own. 
In those days, having no children was an embarrassment, but they stayed together over the years as their affection and respect and love for each other deepened. The priests in Judah took turns serving in the temple in those days, and so once a year, Zechariah would leave Elizabeth, and he would walk all the way to Jerusalem. And with the other priests in his section, they would perform the prescribed duties at the temple. And so he would live there with his colleagues for a week, and they would see to the lighting of the candles, and they would burn the incense, and they would see to all the sacrifices. Every morning they started the day the same way. They would cast lots to see who was going to do which job. And on one glorious day, Zechariah drew the prize that every priest wanted, lighting incense in the sanctuary, just outside the Holy of Holies at the end of the day. You're only allowed to do this once in your lifetime, and many priests never got to do it at all. This was an honor for Zechariah. And best of all, while this is happening, people would gather outside to watch and wait for the smoke of the incense to rise in the evening air, to add their own prayers to the lovely incense rising up to God, and then to receive the blessing which the priest was allowed to confer on them when he emerged from the sanctuary. It was such a special moment. There was no higher occasion in the life of a priest than that one. Well, on that day, Mary told Luke, Zechariah entered the sanctuary to light the incense and he didn't emerge. So people got nervous. They were worried. Nobody stayed in there for very long. And when he did finally come out, he just stood there with a bewildered look on his face. He didn't confer the blessing. He couldn't even speak. People asked him what was wrong, and he couldn't say a word. He never spoke another word until Elizabeth had a baby nine months later. I remember my parents and all the neighbors laughing about it. Now, something happened to me in the midst of all that, too, but that's a story for another day. We'll get together again so I can finish telling you what you've missed. But this story, the good news of Jesus Christ, well, it begins with Elizabeth and Zechariah. Can't you just hear Mary setting Luke straight? Now, it probably didn't happen that way. But there is nothing to keep us from dreaming about a conversation that might have played out. However it happened, whoever is responsible for writing down this story and tacking it on to Luke's gospel, I think we're to assume that to understand the good news that awaits us at Christmas, we have to begin by understanding Zechariah and Elizabeth and the good news of their story that elderly barren couple, who just like the elderly barren couples before them, Abraham and Sarah, Hannah and Elkanah, the barrenness is about so much more than not having children. For Elizabeth and Zechariah, not having children meant not having a future. There was no one to carry on the family name, no one to care for them, and most importantly, no one to receive what had been handed down to them, a relationship with a loving God. Zechariah and Elizabeth are the heirs of the priestly tradition going all the way back to Moses' brother Aaron. And so this story is about so much more than the inability to have Kids, this is a story about the future of faith itself being at stake. They're not simply concerned for themselves. They're concerned because when they think about the future, all they can see is a world where churches sit empty, a world without worship, a world where no one is going to seminary and priests aren't around to quote Isaiah or to point people to the living, life-giving, promise-making God upon whom they'd staked their very lives. 
Now, if you've ever heard a sermon on Zechariah, you probably have heard it preached that Zechariah becoming mute is the punishment for his disbelief, just the consequence of asking one too many questions of an angel. And there are reasons to think this. But I agree with Barbara Brown Taylor, who says, it seems entirely possible to me that his silence was the angel's gift to him. An enforced sabbatical, a gestation period of his own, during which the seeds of hope were sown again in his hushed soul. Zechariah couldn't learn anything with his mouth open. Nothing he could say held a candle to what was happening right in front of him. And his muteness turned out to be the wilderness in which his dream was born. Nine months. Zechariah was silent, observing the new thing God was doing in his midst. And I think this is exactly what we have to understand at the start of a new year if we have a chance at grasping the good news of Jesus Christ. Maybe, Barbara Brown Taylor says, it's time for us to claim the angel's gift of silence again, to stop talking so much, stop trying to explain to shut our own mouths before the terrible mystery of God and see what the quiet has to teach us. Since the very beginning, since Adam and Eve, humans have done the same thing. We have enticed ourselves into believing that we can do it by ourselves, no matter the problem and no mind for our own brokenness. Again and again, we entice ourselves into believing that we hold the capability to redeem ourselves. But if Zechariah teaches us anything, it's this. Advent begins where human potential ends. So the first thing we remember at the start of a new year is that we can't do it ourselves, even though we try. And you may not be able to relate to Zechariah and Elizabeth's childlessness, but I think we can all relate to Zechariah's barrenness because his barrenness was not born of childlessness. It was born of a habit of hopelessness, a lack of imagination about what was possible for the life-giving God he proclaimed to others. He'd given up believing that there could be something new. And don't we all know what that's like? Either because our own lives thrust us into situations where it's hard to avoid hopelessness, deaths, divorces, diagnoses, all sorts of things that require so much energy to navigate that there couldn't possibly be anything left over for imagination. And if it's not in your own life, then all you have to do is open a newspaper or turn on the news to see echoes of just how dark this world is, telling us with each new headline that there are malignant forces working against human well-being and the divine purposes of God. We don't have to look back further than the shootings in Virginia and Colorado to remember this, that our world is dark far too dark to be lit by human potential. And that is where faith begins. To appreciate the miraculousness of that child in a manger on Christmas morning, we have to begin with Zechariah and appreciate just how desperate and dark the situation was when God came to dwell among us. And so the invitation to each of us is to receive that same gift that was offered to Zechariah all those years ago. The gift of silence, where we mute the noise, mute the impulse to explain, mute the human tendency to think that we can solve it for ourselves. Because at the start of Advent, we remember that human potential is not and will never be enough to light this dark world. So in the silence... May we all remember that it is God and God alone who has the power to do something new. In the silence, may we remember that when it's all on the line, when the future of faith itself is on the line like it was in Zechariah's day, it is God who shows up and gets to work in the most unlikely of circumstances because human potential 
fails us every time. It's only through silence that we come to understand Isaiah's Advent promise that the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Amen.